Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Generational Wealth Seminar. Uh, legacy, legacy, legacy. I don't know about anybody else, but I certainly, when I started out investing, it was uh, pretty much about passing on and leaving a legacy to our to our children, both Rob and myself. Uh, I'll introduce you to my, my colleague, who's Rob Watson. Some of you will know Rob, you've been on our webinars before. Rob, do you want to say hello to the to the people? Good evening all. Late and happy new year. Welcome all. So I'm going to kick off, like I said, and um, we're going to start actually with a, with a little poll. This is the agenda of what we're going to run through tonight. A brief introduction to us and, and who we are. Uh, a little story about uh, legacy and generational wealth. We're going to cover what wealth is, um, six steps to creating wealth, and then how to secure your legacy and the next steps that you should be taking uh, in order to uh, either build wealth or, or be passing it on to the next generation. So we're just going to have a little poll so I know who's in the, in the room. And if you could all be kind enough to take part in the poll and give us some answers, because it will certainly help, uh, you know, how we aim the presentation. It's not going to change it at this stage, but it'd be interesting to know why we're here. I'm going to let that run for, well, everybody's voting, so that's good. Any more? A couple more? 22? The other people must be making coffee. There's about five more people to vote, but that's, that's, that's good enough. So... I don't know if you can see those results on there. So everybody seems to be here to understand how to create wealth and also how to be passing that wealth on, which is good, which means I don't have to change anything in the presentation. So as I said, this is the agenda for tonight. So a little bit about us, Rob and myself, we have um, 30 years combined financial services experience. We've been around for a while. I know we don't look that old, but, but we actually are. We've been around and we've uh, we've been here through the wild west days of the early 2000s and self-cert mortgages and uh you know the, the whole credit crunch we've been around and lived through it we are um specialist mortgage and protection advisors we're financial advisors but we specialize in that so anything to do with residential and buy to let mortgages we are particularly strong in the investment market because uh, as i say there on the third one we are property investors of over 20 years ourselves. So we understand, um, you know, how to buy property, you know, how to recycle your cash, how to refinance it, and how to invest well. We've been doing that a long time and we've been helping a lot of clients over the years do the same. Uh, if you've got any questions, um, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll do a quick Q&A towards the end. So I don't know about anyone else, um, but I've often seen the movies where they have a, a reading of the will and you have all the families sitting around and everybody's waiting with bated breath to see who gets what, who gets the Rolex watches, who gets the Rolls Royce, who gets this and who gets that. Um, I don't know about anybody else who's in the room, but I wasn't that lucky. Um, <laughs> but I certainly aspired to be. There was no rich uncles. Although to be fair to my, uh, to my parents, we did all right. I got a start and certainly, um, you know, we were left something, but nothing like, uh, nothing like the Rolls Royces and the, and the generational wealth that I, I really aspire to myself now. So I'd like to be that rich uncle. I'd like to be that rich dad that passes down, you know, masses of wealth that gives the next generation an opportunity to build from. And uh, I don't know if you know the story of EasyJet, Stelios, I can't remember his surname, but his, his father was a steel magnet and he gave him 30 million pounds to start his airline. Now, I'm not trying to be funny. Most people can make a success of a business if they get a 30 million pound head start. So that's what the, this generational wealth to me is about and what it stands for. 
Um, wealth is something that's not built overnight. It, 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 it's it's not a quick thing. It's it's uh, it's it's a generational thing, and it needs time to to, to grow and to marinate. So, what is wealth? How are we defining that? The dictionary definition says it's an abundance of possessions or money. Um, but to me, if you're holding money in the bank, you're actually getting poorer, and that's because of inflation. So, you know, a, a hundred thousand pound today is doesn't buy you as much as a hundred thousand pound did 20 years ago. And that's certainly true for property. You only need to look at house prices and, and the property market to understand that. But even if you look at something a little bit more simple, like how much it costs to fill up your car with petrol or, or bread or, and, and, and milk, um, inflation eats away at money. So I like to think of wealth as an abundance of income generating assets. Uh, and as I tell my children as well, it's not how much money you've got, but how quickly the coffers are refilled. And that's where the income generation comes from. And just to tell you another little story, uh, a, a, an old man once said to me, there's, Paul, there's two important things in life. Uh, health first, because without your health, nothing else really matters. And then income. So how much money is coming in determines how, how you live. So income generating assets is, is the aim. And when you can live your desired lifestyle from the income from your assets, generally you can consider yourself wealthy. If you're not going out to, to have to work and you've got uh, businesses or income coming in and you can live a decent lifestyle, that's, that's my definition of wealth. Would everyone agree with that? Does everyone know how to use the icons in, in, uh, in Zoom? Let me see some thumbs up if you agree with me what I'm saying. If you think I'm chatting rubbish, by all means, you can give me a thumbs down. I don't know if there is a thumbs down in there, but anyway. So income generating assets, what are they? So the obvious one um, that most people are aware of now is, is property. Uh, buy to let is a, is a relatively new introduction. I mean, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there was no buy to let mortgages. You had to be buying cash. You had to be a good, uh, have a good relationship with your bank and put down 50%. Um, the buy to let market was introduced in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it's seen a massive boom in the private rented sector by, by landlords, people like you and I that want to buy and let out a property for the long term and provide an income. Our goal when we started investing was certainly for the next generation um, and to make sure that, you know, there's a pension income for us or, you know, like I said, generational wealth, because over time, no matter what period you look at, if you look over a period of 25 years, house prices typically go up, whether that's from 1970 to 1995 or 1995 to 2020, house prices pretty much go up. In between, we always have some dips. You know, we have booms and busts, but over the long term, it's a good stable asset. So what else are income generating assets? A business, as long as you're not working in your business per se and you're, you're instrumental to your business, then it's, it's, it's a better income generating asset. So if you're building a business, and this is a separate topic, but if you're building a business, you wanna build it as if you're not gonna be there because the whole idea of, of having a business is for you to, well, for me, let me speak for myself, is to be sitting somewhere nicer. Speak for us, sorry, Rob, let me speak for us. The whole idea of building a business is so that we, can go and sit on a beach somewhere um, while the money's still coming in and go and live somewhere warm and sunny. That's my idea anyway. Royalties is for stuff like music, books, films. Once it's been created, you can be paid on it forever. You know, Michael Jackson's back, back, back catalog of music. I can't remember who owns it. Is it Paul McCartney that owns it now? I can't remember. I mean, if you know the answer to that, put it in the chat. I'd, I'd, welcome, uh, I'd welcome the knowledge but that is worth a considerable amount of money. Every time it, a Michael Jackson song is, is played uh, on the radio, there's a royalty check going out somewhere. If it's used in a film, there's a royalty check going out. So that's, a, that's an income generating asset. Dividends, um, dividend shares and funds, again, um, they are good assets to own. Shares are, are more liquid than property, but if you hold the right, 
type of stocks that pay dividends. For example, supermarkets uh, are high cash flow in businesses that usually pay good dividends. Uh, and if, you, if you're not struck by any morals, the tobacco companies always pay out their dividends um, because they've got a product that's addictive and it sells well, despite the litigation around it. But if you, if you compose the right, create the right uh, structure of investments in shares and, and funds and bonds, then that will also give you an income. Peer-to-peer -peer lending. Now, I Googled this one because this is, this is relatively a new thing. But to, to keep it simple and break it down, um, you either work for money or money works for you. So I think when I die and come back, I want to come back as a bank because banks create money and they lend it out and, and, and charge us interest to pay it back. So peer-to-peer -peer lending is having your money work for you, whether you're uh, in, in, the property, uh, in the property game, for example, a lot of JVs are happening now. People are doing joint ventures with people or they're borrowing money from investors in order to put their money to work because you're getting half a percent in the bank and by lending your money out, you might get six to 8%. I've certainly used JV money uh, in the past or investor loan money. And you know I've paid six or six to 8% depending on the structure of the deal and the length of the deal. So everybody wins, you know, I get some money to do, we get some money to do our joint ventures and, and our property investments and the investor gets a better return on their money. So peer-to-peer -peer lending is something that, that can work also. It's a good asset. So I am just going to launch another poll here just to see. Oh, sorry. Was I still sharing the results all that time? Nobody told me. So I'm going to launch another poll. If you could all take part and let me know what kind of assets people own at the moment. Are you a business owner? Do you have property? Is there any artists in the uh, amongst us? Has anybody thought about peer-to-peer -peer lending? Does anybody know about peer-to-peer -peer lending? Answers in the chat, by all means. I mean, it's uh, to stimulate some conversation at the end. That would be good. Just keeping an eye on the time. All right, half the people voting. So there's the results. Um, and as expected, 84% of you own property. It'd be interesting to know whether that's just residential property or whether you've got uh, investment properties also in the background. Um, I should have done another poll for that, but answers in the chat or we can pick it up at the end. The secret to investment anyway is having a diversified portfolio. You diversify risk. Having everything and all your eggs in one basket, that's where diversification comes from. It just doesn't make sense. So having property, having some business income, royalties, shares and funds, having a diversified portfolio of investments is the way to go. So thank you to all of those who voted in that. So for those of you invest in property or those who don't invest in property or are interested in knowing how that works, um, it not only buying property not only provides an income for you, but it also allows for capital growth through rising house prices. As I said, over a 25 year uh, period, over a generation, um, house prices are pretty much going to, I won't say double, but they've done more than double in 25 years um, generally. But you're going to see some growth. So it's a good investment from that point of view. Um, so here's a, a, an example of uh, a property investment, a typical property investment. You know, you buy something for 200,000, you need a 25% deposit for a buy-to-let investment mortgage. For those who don't know, so that would be 50,000 down and you'd have a mortgage of 150,000. Now we are living in um, historically the lowest interest rate environment for, I don't know, 200, 300 years, if not ever. So we are seeing two year and five year mortgage rates at 2% or below, even on buy to let. So on, a, on borrowings of 150,000 at 2%, you'd have a mortgage of 250 pounds. Now, rental income typically for, for anywhere, especially in London, you're gonna be paying at least a thousand pound a month. I'm not saying you can buy a property in London for 200,000. You can probably get a one bed somewhere for that kind of money. 
uh, if you buy well. But rental income, to keep the numbers simple, uh, I've put rental income as a thousand. So you'd make a monthly profit of 750 pound or annual income of 9,000. So that's a return on your money of 18% compared to what you're getting uh, in the bank, which is next to nothing, 0.5%. Whether you're holding it as cash ISAs or high interest account, even in high interest accounts, you'd be lucky to get 1%, 1 1.5% with the base rate where it is. So that's property investment for those who need to understand. So what are the steps to wealth creation? If you're starting from scratch, um, the first thing, would be to get out of debt if you're in debt. And to be fair, Rob and I see, um, you know, we help a lot of people gain mortgages and 95% of people are carrying some debt, whether it's 500 pound to 5,000 pounds on credit cards, whether it's uh, loans, car finance, everybody's carrying some element of debt. So some debt you, is, it makes sense to have, like in a car, for example, it, it maybe makes sense to lease it rather than buy it for cash because it's a depreciating asset. But generally credit card debt uh, and loan debt is, is bad. Yeah, it depends on what you use the money for. But if you're, if you're sitting in debt and paying interest, um, the first step that you need to do is to get out of debt. And I don't know if anybody's heard of compound interest, but the, the, the secret to growing wealth over the long term is about compound interest. So when you're in debt, the credit card companies are, are using your debt to grow their wealth. So if you're in debt, it's working in reverse. Compound interest works great. So the idea of it is the money that you save and then invest as we move through the steps, the, the children of those investments, the interest that you gain or the income that you gain, you reinvest. So your, your investment is always growing and compounding over the long term. So the first step, step one is to get out of debt. Step two is to save. You should never uh, spend more than you earn. There's a really good book called The Richest, that Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson that, that talks about that. You should you know, aim to save a percentage, target a percentage of your income uh, and increase that over time. Typically, that would be 10%. That's what the book talks about. It talks about saving 10% of your income. And you should pay yourself first. So a lot of people, when they get paid, you know, they worry about paying their mortgage. They worry about paying, you know, I've got to pay for this. I've got to pay my bills. I've got to pay my credit card company. I've got to pay the loans. You should pay yourself first and transfer some money to a savings account. That is the first step. Once you have adequate savings, you should then invest it. Now, initially, if you can't afford to get into property, then that might be in, in an ISA through um, shares and uh, stocks and shares ISA, for example. So investment. Once you have larger investments, then you can speculate in things that are a little bit more, more risky. You might start a business. Um, and then, as I said, the secret is, is diversification to minimize your risk and not carry all your eggs in one basket. The final step is to insure those assets and to protect them, to make sure that in the event of anything, you know, that wealth and all of those good habits that you've had over time, you've, you've protected it. So I'm just gonna to touch on the last step. You've had a lifetime of discipline. You've, you've, uh, you've had a lifetime of discipline. You've, you've saved first, you've not spent all of your money, you've not overspent, you've created all of this wealth. It is extremely vital to protect it. And even in that book, um, uh, richest man in Babylon, it talks about that, ensuring that you protect your wealth and secure it. Uh, Warren Buffet is the, 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 the most recognized investor in the world and he, he invests in value in things that he understands. Uh, but he's built that over time. And what he talks about is not having any losses. So it's important that you protect what you've built and you've spent a lifetime building. You make sure you protect that for your future generations. So how do you protect it? How do you protect it? So the first step is, well, you've built it. So you need to assess what you've got. Is it businesses? Is it assets? Is it um, buy to let properties? What, what have I got? Who do you plan to leave it to? You know, what's, do you want to leave it to your kids? Do you want to leave it to your grandkids? Um, I've certainly been telling my children, I'm going to leave my stuff to the grandkids. So 
you need to make sure that that's that's you've got a plan for that are your assets adequately insured um you know it's it's very easy for the disaster to strike i mean shares as you as a financial advisor uh, that, that deals with investments which i don't but they will tell you as you get older it's more important to shift away from uh, riskier assets so when you're young and you've got time for for compound interest to work for you you will invest in shares and growth stocks um you know uh, equities as you get older you need to protect that so you lower your equities and invest more in bonds which are more stable the prices aren't going to fall and it's going to give you an income later on it's the same for your uh, for your assets you need to insure yourself so this is the important thing what happens in the event of anything happening to you what happens to your to your uh, wealth assets if you've got a business and you're still instrumental in it what happens to you what happens to your shareholding if you're in business together with somebody else what happens you you pass away does your partner roll up on on monday morning and say okay i'm here um, I'm, I'm here to make decisions for the company you know you need there's things that you can do to put in place to mitigate that what happens to your mortgages? What happens to your buy-to-let properties? Have you got something in place to, to um, pay off those liabilities? You need to consider use of trust. You know, when, when clients come to us to protect their, uh, their property assets, we always put things in, in trust. We put policies in trust, but there's also other trusts that you can use um, to transfer your wealth to the next generation. And a, a perfect example of that is the, the Duke of Westminster, that estate, I don't know, is it, is it the Grosvenor estate? Again, put it in the chat and let me know. Um, but they seem to be passing down billions, I think last last told it was nine or 10 billion pound worth of wealth without paying any tax on it by use of trust. So those aren't the trusts that we deal with. We can put you in touch with people that can, can help you with that. But we deal with the insuring yourself. Um, most importantly, you also need to make a will. You, you know, your last will and testament, who are you leaving the stuff to? That goes with who, you know, what are you planning for? So the next steps, there's a very common misconception that with a buy to let mortgage, your, your people that you leave behind can continue to pay the mortgage to the bank uh, and, and keep the property. That is not true. The bank um, cannot have a, a loan agreement with somebody who's dead. It's as simple as that. The mortgage dies with you. So what they will do is they will take back that property and they will put it in the auction room and sell it for 60, 70 pence in the pound in order to get their money back. Uh, and whatever's left over will go to your beneficiaries. Now, it would, you know, that's a waste of 30, 40% of, of, of your wealth. So the idea is to protect that with some life cover. Uh, and life covers got a lot cheaper over the years. You know, we talk to people about income protection and critical illness cover and all of these things, but life covers quite cheap because we're all living longer. So, you know, it's almost, uh, it's almost foolhardy not to protect your wealth that you've spent how many years building and watching it grow and then letting the bank snatch it back and sell it for somebody else's gain. You know, somebody like like Rob and I are going to snap it up in the auction room for 60, 70 pence in the pound. It's, it's you know, it's it makes sense to protect that. So what we're offering today is a no obligation quote. We can, um, you know, on the next slide there, on the next slide here, we are offering a no obligation quote. And because we know that nobody wakes up in the morning and thinks, I need to buy some life cover today. They just don't do it. Nothing ever happens like that. Life cover is something that needs to be sold. You need to understand that you need it. And I'm hoping that you're getting that impression today from this presentation. So for those who are action takers, we've got a special offer for you. For anybody who uh, gets a quote and takes out a policy and protects themselves and their family and their assets, and secures their, their wealth for the next generation, despite all of those pluses that you need to be doing it anyway, we're gonna give you an incentive. Um, 
poor old Jeff Bezos, who's no longer the richest man in the world. So we thought we'd help him out. Uh, Elon Musk has overtaken him as the richest man because Tesla's share price has gone through the roof. So we're going to help out poor Jeff. I know he's struggling. So we're going to offer some vouchers to either Amazon, or John Lewis and MS to anybody who takes action uh, and protects themselves by the end of February and puts it on risk. How do you do that? Uh, it's quite simple, really. Rob's going to drop that, um, that bit.ly in the chat. If you click on that, it will take you to our online form. It takes a couple of minutes to complete. We'll have your details, fill in how much life cover you need, and we will send you a no obligation quote. At least then you can make an informed decision. Um, there's no pressure. We're not going to pressure you to do that, uh, uh, you know, to take up the quote. But we advise you to at least make an informed decision because a lot of people have a misconception that insurance is expensive. Uh, I, I don't want to take it. I can't afford it. But how do you know until you check? So I would ask you all to assess what assets you own and are they adequately protected and get a no obligation quote. It doesn't cost you anything. And actually, you could end up getting back, I don't know, a month or two uh, worth of vouchers, what a month or two of premium in, in, in vouchers if you take action right now. So that's it. Look at that. 7.32. Bang on. Um, if you want to speak to Rob uh, about um, protection or anything else that we've discussed today, there's a bit.ly you can book a call directly into his diary. Uh, and we've also got a protection uh, ebook which covers everything and, and all of the bits and pieces um, that we offer around that. So hopefully that has been useful uh we haven't overrun um the links there so i'm gonna stop sharing my screen rob have you put those in the uh in the chat is he frozen yeah that's there I'll just... excellent thank you so i'm gonna stop sharing my screen and that is 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 the end and we'll be happy to to field any questions yeah so sandra had one mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm right. Just wanted to understand more about just a, just peer to peer lending. If you could just give like a quick sort of like a two line indicative definition of what that is, please, sir. So peer to peer lending is um, is crowdfunding effectively. So there's a lot of crowdfunding platforms around now where you can, uh, especially in the property arena. They are FCA regulated, the ones, make sure that you, you, you deal with one appropriately. And you can you can lend anything from 500 pound to, to 50,000 at, at a particular rate. So it's a crowd crowdfunding platform where you lend money. Yeah, you invest money. It's in the property sphere, it's usually for, for 12 to 18 months uh, and they'll pay you a rate of six or 8% on your money, which is more than you're getting in the bank. So that's that's what peer to peer lending is. That's that's what it is. But obviously, as I mentioned, um, with you know friends and family and people that I know personally, not out to the public and people that I don't know, um, I've had people lend money for, for for investment projects. That's also peer to peer lending. But the peer to peer lending that I advise you to stick to, uh, I'm not um, soliciting any money here. Uh, let me just put a disclaimer out there right now. Um, if you look for crowdfunding platforms, if you connect with us, then then I can probably point you in the direction of a few crowdfunding platforms if, if you're interested. Yeah, Paul, thank you. Um, and also I have another question, Paul, in from Bianca Johnson. Um, question was, my son is an artist, he's 14 years old, so would like to know more about royalties and how this will help him. Uh, well, royalties, if, if you if you look at the music industry, and I'm not going to spend too long on this, but if you look at the music industry, uh, the, the, the way that it used to work is a record company would, uh, what type of artist is he? Is he I'm, I'm assuming he's a music artist. I'm assuming he's a music artist. So whatever you create as an artist, whether it, you've written a book or 
of creating a music piece or you write music, whenever it's used, you earn an income from it. And it's important that you try and own your, uh, your IP with that. It's quite a specialized subject, uh, royalties, but it's, it's the Michael Jackson thing. If you think about the story that I told there, then that, that's what you should consider. Any, anytime his, his, his work is used, there should be a payment for it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, he's a sketcher, he's an artist, he draws. He draws. Sorry. Okay, so if his artwork was used anywhere, um, you know, artwork is normally traded and sold individual pieces but if his artwork was used anywhere in on, on on tv or media then there'd be a royalty payment for it does that help thank you you're welcome next question what we got rob see actually we had one that came in but i was i was busy tapping um so i think i've answered it um sandra sandra writes asked a question if i found a property for two hundred thousand with 50 with a 50 deposit how much would it cost to do the searches etc um i mean i answered that by just saying essentially you know you've got um search costs actually depend on the property type location of the property in relation to local authority um although additional co costs you're going to take into consideration and I'm, I'm reading the verbatim guys um include legal fees potential stamp duty costs um and implications i mean i know there's a bit of a an MC period at the moment um and also the lender associated fees if you're taking out a mortgage Okay, some lenders have arrangement fees and then there are additional fees such as um, valuation, um, you know, and don't forget to factor in any associated moving in and potential renovation costs. Paul, do you want to add to that? <coughs> no, I think you've smashed that one out of the park. I think that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michelle asked a question, please tell us what value vouchers are being offered. You want to answer that, shall I? You answer it. Good value, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, essentially, it's an incentive that we're offering. I mean, we make it very meaningful, um, to put it very mildly. It's not a all right, I'll, I'll, stick I'll, in there. I'll answer it. I'll answer it. Okay. I'll answer it. I'll answer it. it, it it's going to depend on the level of policy that you take, but I'd imagine mm -hmm. it's going to be £50 upwards. We've got £100 in our head as what the voucher price would be, but okay. you know, if you took an £8 policy then, you know, it's likely to be £50. We'll, we'll verify it. So it's between 50 and £100. Yeah. It's going to be 50 or 100 We're not, we're not trying to, be, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible there. Yeah. Um, Bianca's asked another question. Do you think child trust funds interests go back up? It's going down due to COVID. Child trust funds? I don't under, I don't understand the question. What to say that again? Do I? Do you think child trust funds interests go back up? It's gone down due to COVID. Bianca, if you're still there, interest on mute. Yeah. yeah um, so basically, there's a lot of um, some quite a few parents have child trust funds um, yeah. and just funds in general. And due to COVID, um, we got letters sent out saying that we're not going to get the this amount of interest that we was told at the beginning of taking the account out due to COVID. And I just wanted to know, do you think that these, like the interest will go back to normal have, when COVID you, is kind of over? Have you um, put them in cash ISAs or cash trust funds? Is it cash? It just says junior ISA. Oh, that's yeah, but, it so the, the, the junior I ISA. So it's just stocks and shares. The, the junior ISA is a wrapper and you can either hold cash or you can have uh, stocks and shares. So it it's all depends. Stocks it's stocks and shares. Um, it all depends on what it's invested in. So uh, um, the investment market, it, it all depends on what it's invested in. So if you had, um, for example, part of my investment was in gold. I started buying a, a gold investment. Gold's up. 60% or something in the year because they've turned the printing presses on. If I had shares in retail stocks, like Debenhams is going out of business, Arcadia Group, for example, then you know your money will go down. So it all depends on what your junior ISA is invested in, is, is the point. Because you can, okay. I don't know whether you control it yourself or whether you're in 
Um, it's with NatWest. It's with NatWest, but do you know what the underlying investment is? No. No, it just they says that they've they said that they give it to the Royal Bank of 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 Scotland. England. Royal Bank of Scotland. Scotland. Yeah, Scotland. Yeah. RBS and that way, so the, 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 the same. So what you need to understand is, what is that junior ISA invested in? Yeah, because sometimes you can choose. Most times you can choose. So again, I'm, I'm not giving any, I'm not qualified to give investment advice here. I'm only speaking from my own um, perspective, but you know, you can select where you put your investment funds. So usually they'll give you a list of different funds that you can invest in, UK or share, European fund, US equity funds. There's, there's usually a, a choice and it depends on where you've put your money will determine what sort of return you're gonna get because some things are going up. Uh, you know, look, we're on Zoom right now. Um, you know, the guy who created Zoom has been voted business man of the year or something all of a sudden, but he's just in the right place at the right time. But if you if you would have bought Zoom stock two, three years ago, now you would have seen a massive increase. Same with Tesla. Um, you know, so it all depends on where the money's invested. Okay. Sorry, I just have one more question. I know before you said that house house prices will probably go up, but I was kind of taught that it just depends on how it just depends on when you decide to sell or when you decide to rent like there's there has been times when house prices have literally gone to down and people have lost out so yeah um B bianca what 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 decade was you born in 90 you were born in the 90s yeah so if you would have bought a house in the 90s now I've seen a 600% a, a return on, on houses. But however, if you were to bought in the 80s, um, you might have seen a negative fall. So through the 80s, when interest rates went up, house prices fell quite, quite dramatically and there were people that lost out. However, if you would have held on to that house and rode out the storm, then you would have seen the growth again. So if you'd have born in bought in the 70s until the 90s, you would have seen another 600 percent return. So you're right, the, the price of something only matters when you're buying it or selling it. But if you're forced to sell at a time when when the market is is having a dip, then you might lose out. But what I said is over the long term, we're talking about generations here. If you look at a 25 year period, um, you, you typically don't lose. You see the ups and the downs, but the way that they devalue money forces asset prices up. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Beautiful. I've got one last question in um, from Terry Ann Thurwell. Happy New Year, Terry Ann. Um, and the question is, is life cover, a whole life cover, or just for a period of time? Hi, Terry Ann. Nice to, uh, nice to see you on board. Um, so, there are two types of cover. There is a whole life cover policy, which um, can be expensive because it, it it definitely pays out on, on death. So it covers you even if you live to 150. Uh, typically life cover is for a period of time and we're covering uh, a particular asset. But what we've got now is um, insurance companies offering policies until 90, 95, Rob? Yeah. 30, 30, 35, 40 year terms. So, uh, and that might, there's a small risk, but that might work out more economical. But a whole of life policy, a whole life, whole of life, life cover guarantees to, to, to pay out. Good question. Any more? We're running over 45 minutes. How many have we got on? 21. If there's no more questions, I think uh, we're good. Rob, do you want to sign us out? Yeah, just love to thank everybody. Thank everybody for joining the session. Hopefully, you've all found it useful and taken some bits and bobs uh, that will be thought provoking at least.
hopefully get you engaged in thinking about what's important to you in the next steps. Um, left some contact information there, but please, pretty please feel free to reach out and have a discussion with us about how we can best service you or at least walk you through the process to ensure that where you've taken time out to build up wealth for your family, where you've taken time out to build up assets for yourself, and more importantly, where you've taken time out to actually create a legacy to hand down through the generations that you consider some of the points that Paul's raised and we've discussed during this half an hour session. Um, we urge you as a company, um, as individuals that have been on this side of the, the financial fence for some time um, to reach out um, so we can take you through that journey and hopefully help you to ring fence what you've taken time to build up. I'd like to thank you all for joining. Hope to see you soon. Thank you.